than 10 years after it ended, the Vietnam War might seem a remote little affair. In fact, it was an enormous conflict, the longest war in American history, and the only one from which the USA did not emerge victorious. During it, a greater tonnage of bombs was dropped than in World War II. Hundreds of thousands of rockets were fired, and millions of cannon shells and bullets expended. It was the war in which the helicopter came into its own, and where every type of aircraft was used. In 1962, as the USA tried to help South Vietnam resist being taken over by the Communist North, it seemed a job for modest, propeller-driven aircraft, such as the Helio U-10A Courier, the famed Douglas C-47, and the bigger Curtis C-46 Commando. The last two, both of Second World War vintage. There was also the agile North American T-28 trainer and the speedy Douglas B-26B invader, yet another World War II veteran. A special force of USAF air commandos was created with a new uniform which included a bush hat. After training at the Air Force's biggest stateside base, Eglin in Florida, they went to South Vietnam where they began to train the infant VNAF, the Vietnamese Air Force. The VNAF used aircraft insignia resembling that of the USA, but with sidebars of red and yellow instead of blue and white. Much of the early tactical instruction was done in the T-28D, a trainer with performance similar to that of a World War II fighter. It could carry unguided rockets, hundreds of rounds of ammunition for 50 caliber heavy machine guns and various bomb loads, including light practice bombs. Big five inch high velocity aircraft rockets and 100 pound bombs could easily be loaded onto the pylons under the wings of a B-26B. These versatile attack bombers were often older than their pilots, but against ill-equipped troops, they were formidable. Together with the smaller T-28D, they began the process of plastering Vietnam with rockets, gunfire and bombs, and if they could see a target, weapons delivery could be quite accurate. Many training missions were also flown by both types, and though hitting the targets on the ranges was a world away from in-country airstrikes, it was useful practice. One weapon that hardly needed accuracy was napalm, a tank full of jellied naphtha and palm oil that, if it hit human skin, would go on burning even underwater. Air transport was obviously going to be important in Vietnam, where there were few roads. The little U-10A could drop up to six paratroops. Another advantage was that it could operate from short and rough airstrips. The bigger C-47 could carry far more men and equipment. It was used, particularly in the early years, for the transport of Green Beret Special Forces in support of the Vietnamese Civilian Irregular Defense Group program. Especially on a hot day, a loaded C-47 would have to make a RATO, a rocket-assisted takeoff. When the rockets had burned out, they would be jettisoned. As for the whale-like C-46D, this needed every ounce of thrust from its 2,000 horsepower engines to make a full load takeoff. Only one combat parachute jump was made in March 1967 
by the 173rd Airborne Brigade during Operation Junction City near the Cambodian border. Meanwhile, in the early years, the T-28Ds and the B-26s kept up their sustained attacks on the elusive enemy in South Vietnam. The U.S. was becoming progressively more involved in the war, both on the ground and in the air. Helicopters of all kinds played a central role throughout the war. The oldest were the Sikorsky H-34 piston-engined transports, and many were given to the VNAF. Powered by a 1,500-horsepower Cyclone engine, the H-34 could typically airlift 16 troops and their equipment. Flying at low level, at about 90 miles per hour, it was usual to leave the side door open and fit a heavy 50 caliber machine gun. Supply missions were flown to the many fortified hamlets with which the government forces sought to control the countryside. Because the hamlets were mainly in remote areas, most supplies were brought in by helicopter, and these included sacks of rice and, on occasion, camp followers. Altogether, more than 10,000 helicopters were used in the Southeast Asia Theater, where they became the workhorse of the infantry. Few of them made it back to the USA. In 1965, the US Air Force, which had not itself bought the neat little Northrop F-5 Freedom Fighter for its own use, leased a dozen of these supersonic machines and formed them into a unit called the Scotia Tigers. Initial training was done at Williams Air Force Base in the States, and they left for Vietnam in October 1965. Two months later, they were in action against Viet Cong positions near Saigon. The useful load of 750-pound bombs and rockets had a devastating effect against VC ambush positions along South Vietnam's highways. Reported enemy concentrations were also the subject of airstrikes with both bombs and cannon. Increasingly, the U.S. involvement was becoming full-scale war. Big and bold, the North American F-100 Super Sabre bore a mighty burden in both the attack and fighter roles. In 1953, it had been the world's first supersonic fighter. Thirteen years later, it was still in frontline service. In 1966, F-100s of the 531st Tactical Fighter Wing at Bien Ho Air Base were flying almost round the clock. They were never parked in the open, but in blast-proof revetments, safe except for a direct hit from above against VC mortar or rocket attacks. Armed with snake eye retarded bombs, the Super Sabres were adept at low-level strike missions. Most of the U.S. Army's aircraft were helicopters. An exception was the twin turboprop Grumman OV-1 Mohawk a battlefield reconnaissance plane with about the speed and agility of a wartime Spitfire and the ability to use short, rough airstrips. Slow-flying Mohawks often sustained damage. With one engine dead, an emergency landing was necessary, as at Bin Toy Air Base. Some Mohawks carried weapons, but their main purpose was to use the big bug-eye windows and cameras to keep the generals literally in the picture. The C-47 was also used in the Psy War role. Showering the country with leaflets was part of the policy of winning the hearts and minds of the population, 
and especially the VC soldiers. The U-10B was also used for this purpose and could carry a powerful loudspeaker as well as bundles of leaflets. As the war went on, leaflets tended to be replaced by firepower. The air war in Vietnam saw the introduction of a weapon unique in warfare. Because of the difficulty of never seeing the enemy among the foliage, Operation Pink Rose was mounted to determine the techniques and conditions needed to defoliate the jungle. Some experiments were made to destroy the vegetation by fire. In the main, though, specially equipped UC-123B transports holding formation at low level put down wide swaths of chemical defoliant. Particular attention was paid to suspected VC lines of communication, and these naturally included the hundreds of miles of trails in the highlands and also the coastal waterways in South Vietnam. Between 1962 and 1971, over 19 million gallons were sprayed in what were called ranch hand missions. Nobody appreciated at the time that Agent Orange, the commonest chemical used, would have adverse medical effects on millions of people, including probably the U.S. veterans of Vietnam. Of all aircraft in action in Vietnam, the greatest was unquestionably the McDonnell F-4 Phantom. It was first built as a high-altitude carrier-based interceptor for the Navy and Marines. Among those Air Force units which flew the F-4C version in Vietnam were the gunfighters of the 366th Tactical Fighter Wing. Their Phantoms carried four big Sparrow air-to-air -air missiles, six Mark 82 bombs, a centerline gun pod, and two drop tanks. Capable of flying at twice the speed of sound, the Phantom could knock down North Vietnamese MiG fighters as well as making effective ground attacks. The gunfighters were based at Da Nang, one of the huge permanent air bases constructed by the US in Vietnam. To support the war's continuous air operations, vast tonnages of bombs had to be assembled and stored. In getting ready for a mission, the selected mix of bombs were jacked up and attached below the aircraft. To maximize the load the aircraft could carry, special multiple pylons were often used, where three bombs could be fitted to the same hard point. Once the bombs were safely attached to the aircraft, the fuses were armed and fitted in the nose of each weapon. Da Nang was also home to Martin B-57Bs, the U.S. version of the British Canberra Light Bomber, which was also flown in Vietnam by the Royal Australian Air Force. B-57s put down 1,000-pound bombs on targets in both North and South Vietnam and could also strafe targets with their four 20-millimeter cannon. The B-57 featured a heavy bomb load, amazing agility for such a large aircraft, and the ability to spend a long time at low level over the target. A special version, the B-57G, was packed with sensors which enabled it to make precision attacks on the darkest of nights.
The tough C-123 providers, as well as defoliating the jungle, flew thousands of frontline resupply missions. You call, we haul was their motto, and they could fly in stores and equipment and up to 61 troops. On the return trip, 56 casualties could be brought out. Occasionally, the return cargo also included the scared kids who typified a high proportion of the VC Irregular Forces prisoners. Such prisoners also arrived by Sikorsky HH-3C helicopter and were taken away for interrogation. Often the C-123s were also called upon to paradrop supplies. However, it can't have been too often that the loads included live cows. Some way off the coast of Vietnam, usually in the Gulf of Tonkin, giant carriers of the U.S. Navy made a massive contribution to American air power over Vietnam. Here, aboard the mighty USS Constellation, the windshield of a Vought A7A Corsair II is polished, ready for another mission with a load of Mark 82 bombs. On a carrier, every man on deck has a shirt whose color tells his job. Red shirts are ordnance men, and they live with bombs, fuses, and all that's dangerous. Everything on deck is choreographed like a ballet to get perhaps 90 planes loaded and blasted off in quick succession by the mighty steam catapults. As with land-based aircraft, various weapon loads could be fitted to the Navy's carrier-borne aircraft. Particularly hard work was loading the pods of the massive 5-inch rockets. The pilot will do his final walk-round check of his aircraft and its armament before he climbs aboard. It is up to him to check that all his weapons are ready for use. Every Navy pilot knows that a catapult launch, or cat shot, is so powerful that it would fling his loaded plane off the carrier's bows at full flying speed, even if his wheel brakes were locked. Different types of aircraft leave the carrier. An F-4J Phantom is slammed off the deck like a toy. Next is an A-4 Skyhawk attack aircraft, followed by another F-4. And then a huge RA-5C Vigilante Reconnaissance plane. The A-7 subsonic attack aircraft was developed from the F-8 Crusader supersonic fighter. Both types saw action over North Vietnam. In many of these attacks, mighty Zuni rockets were fired from F-8E Crusaders. Their Navy pilots were trained to shoot down other aircraft with guns and missiles. Diving at the jungle was less satisfying because while a Zuni made an impressive bang, you never knew if you hit anything. 
In reality, the rockets followed such an erratic course, there was never any possibility of actually making them hit a particular spot. In any case, there were always plenty of people down below firing back. At first, the North Vietnamese defenses were weak, but they gradually built up to become the strongest ever assembled, especially in the area around Hanoi and its port at Haiphong. Even in the 1960s, thousands of light AA guns would fire on every attacker, just as the Soviet troops did on German aircraft in World War II. In exactly the same way, the sheer number of bullets and shells caused an unexpected number of American losses. Accordingly, the U.S. aircraft then tended to stay up about 10,000 feet, but the flak got heavier, with guns of 37, 57, 85, and even 100 millimeters caliber reaching up to them. US Navy number 150826 had been a costly RA-5C vigilante which automatically relayed back to the fleet pin-sharp radar pictures of the target. It would transmit no more. Up above, it was as tough for the Navy and Marine Corps flyers as for anyone else. The attackers, flying F-8Es, put down napalm on supposed VC concentrations in the jungle. Occasionally, one of the napes would break apart, a fragment arcing high into the sky. Usually, the attack was just marked by the huge orange fireball. Douglas A-4C Skyhawks of Navy Squadron VA-76 were also in action, making steep diving attacks on North Vietnamese ground installations. Other A-4s were at work pulling round in a turn to the left that becomes a half roll to the inverted position before lining up for an attack on the target area at Than Lin. Popularly called the Scooter, the Skyhawk was a brilliantly simple jet attack aircraft which was in production from 1954 to 1979. Continuing their attacks, the leading Skyhawk lets go a Zuni which wobbles and oscillates until it hits in the jungle pretty much where it was meant to. The lucky ones got back. An A-7A slams onto Constellation's deck 
and is brutally stopped by the arrestor cable. It was the last Navy attack mission against the North prior to a bombing halt ordered from Washington on 20th November, 1968. One group who never stopped were the Huey drivers. The Bell UH-1, officially the Iroquois, but universally called the Huey, was the most widely used aircraft in the entire theater of war. A tough, medium-sized helicopter, most of those in Vietnam had a turboshaft engine generating a little over a thousand horsepower and could carry 14 troops or six litter casualties at about 113 miles per hour. Many in Vietnam were fitted with an armament scheme comprising four M60 machine guns, two on each side, and two 7-tube rocket launchers all firing ahead. The 2.75-inch folding fin aircraft rockets were part of the armament of the UH-1Bs of Navy Hilo Light Attack Squadron No. 3, known as the Sea Wolves, who were tasked with keeping the VC from infiltrating the canals and villages in the extensive Mekong Delta area. in conjunction with small warships and hovercraft, the Sea Wolves had the advantage of mobility and could cover large areas of water, beach, mud flats, and often densely forested land. Targets, if there were any, were usually in the jungle. This was a central problem throughout the long Vietnam War. Nobody had invented a simple sensor able to detect the VC or even the regular army of North Vietnam as they stealthily moved through the thick vegetation. Some attempts had been made, the devices relying on body heat or even perspiration, but the pilots and gunners up aloft had no such help. All they could do was try to imagine where the enemy might be and blast the area with rockets and the forward-firing M60s. Meanwhile, the door gunner had his own M60 mounted on a pintle to pivot through a wide arc. Even this crewman, who had an almost perfect view, rarely caught sight of the enemy. Statistically, some of the countless rounds fired must have hit someone. If the enemy was spotted by the infantry on the ground or from the air, smoke markers were put down to indicate a likely aiming point. Though by the time firepower arrived, it didn't necessarily mean that the VC were still there. Most of the vast fleets of Hueys belonged to the U.S. Army, and many were later transferred to South Vietnam. Most were used in the transport role. One constant job was the rapid evacuation of casualties, or dust-off, from jungle clearings or rice paddies. Once aboard, the wounded soldier would be rushed to an aid station.
A lower proportion of U.S. casualties died in Vietnam than in any war so far, and medical evacuation by helicopter had a lot to do with this. also transported troops into battle. A slightly bigger version, the UH-1D, was operated in 1967 by, amongst other units, the 68th Assault Helicopter Company. The transport helicopters, known as Slicks, would approach their landing area in formation so as to allow for the safe dispersal of their infantry. in war have been so overtly aggressive as the troop of helicopters thundering and clattering their way across the countryside, the door gunners firing almost continuously. The M60 machine guns often became almost red hot as they sprayed 7.62 millimeter bullets over the rice paddies, into huts, and through the trees. Ahead, the LZ, the landing zone, would be marked by colored smoke grenades. This kind of mission was officially termed an insertion of ground forces. Once the infantry had left the Hueys, the aircraft would be on their way again, their machine guns hosing the surrounding countryside. Perhaps the most publicized battle of the war began on 20th January 1968, when North Vietnamese forces began to encircle the forward Marine Corps base at Khe Sanh. One of the first outlying points to fall was the Special Forces camp at Lang Ve. On the 5th of February, this camp was attacked by F-100s and F-4s of the U.S. Air Force, using napalm and rockets from very low level to make sure of getting hits. The bloody battle raged throughout the first quarter of 1968, and for 77 days, Khe Sanh itself was under siege with continual incoming artillery and mortar fire. The Marine garrison could only be supplied by air. This arriving Boeing Vertol CH-46 Sea Knight was not going to hang about. Cessna O2A light forward air control aircraft did fly in. C-123 providers brought in food and ammunition, often not even stopping to unload cargo. The base was also supplied by the C-130 Hercules, another workhorse of Vietnam. These mighty aerial trucks would dump their cargo and then thunder straight back aloft. With the NV Army all around, the supersonic McDonnell RF-101C Voodoo photo recon aircraft worked round the clock. Some were shot down. Thank you. 
Other casualties were Marine Corps A-4 Skyhawks. Almost before the pilot's feet touch the ground, a Sikorsky HH-3C Jolly Green Giant hurries out to rescue him, saving him from five years of ill treatment as a prisoner of war in what everyone called the Hanoi Hilton. Drops went down on the wrong place, making a present of vitally needed supplies to the enemy. At Khe Sanh, the Herky birds aimed their 20-ton loads with an accuracy measured in feet, and this was repeated during other airdrops in the following months. Following the raising of the siege, the Army's Sikorsky CH-54 Tarhe flying crane helicopters brought in howitzers slung underneath. Precision drops by C-130s continued, while Air Force Phantoms flew top cover. Occasionally, for example to collect casualties, C-130s had to run the gauntlet and make a landing. Full reverse thrust from the propellers on the rough dirt airstrip surrounded the big aircraft in dust, but that did little to spoil the aim of the NVA guns and mortars. This landing was in A. Shaw Valley, after the siege had been lifted in May 1968. One of the aircraft passed to the South Vietnamese was the Cessna A-37 Dragonfly, a light attack jet ideal for low strafing runs using its 7.62 millimeter minigun against exposed troops east of Quang Nai City. The handover of this equipment was part of the policy of Vietnamization where the South Vietnamese forces were progressively trained to take over the fighting of the war. Another aircraft handed over was the 100 mile per hour Cessna 01E Bird Dog light plane. This pilot is briefed for a FAC, forward air control mission. And then inspects his airplane under the eyes of a US instructor pointing out the big smoke marker rockets. Perhaps the most effective of all was the Douglas A-1 Sky Raider. Back in 1944, the Sky Raider had been designed by Ed Heinemann, whose many other designs included the wartime B-26 Invader and the A-4 Skyhawk. The A-1 Sky Raider was designed to fly off carrier decks on Navy missions, but in Vietnam they did just about everything, and carried everything, on one occasion including a suitably inscribed kitchen sink. Typical of VNAF Sky Raiders operations were those from Binh Thai Air Base. They are using their 20 millimeter cannon, rockets and bombs under the direction of the FAC, flying over the trees below them in his little O-1E. VNAF Sky Raider attacks were one of the highlights of the transfer of combat from America to South Vietnam.
Republic Aviation's mighty thud, properly called the F-105 Thunder Chief, was one of the most respected battle wagons of the war. Though it had only one engine and one seat, this U.S. Air Force attack fighter was bigger, heavier, and more powerful than many bombers. Thuds made more attack missions on heavily defended targets in North Vietnam than any other type, and their losses were in proportion to the task done. Some F-105Ds came from the 34th Tactical Fighter Squadron at Korat Air Base in Thailand. Each carried six M117 bombs, which actually weighed much more than the nominal figure of 750 pounds. Thud attacks were made against the rail yards at Kep, Viet Tri, and Yen Bay. Typical of the operations flown were a bullpup radio-guided missile attack on a barge 30 miles northwest of Dong Hoa. At the receiving end, every available gun that could be brought to bear was used, including a Soviet-supplied DSHK of 12.7 millimeters caliber. low, all hands collect up the empties and perform essential maintenance on the guns. Fresh ammunition is brought up. In anticipation of further raids, the protecting revetment is built stronger and higher. Filled craters gradually became part of the normal Vietnam landscape. F-105s attacked the Kep, Cao Nung, and Lang Son rail yards north of Hanoi using 750-pound GP bombs. Plenty of flak was coming the other way from 37mm AA guns. Again, the thuds hit a rail bridge in the back Giang complex using rockets as well as bombs. In October 1967, the F-105s scored hits on the mighty Doomer Bridge near downtown Hanoi. This great bridge had resisted hundreds of attacks, but fell when finally the pinpoint laser-guided smart bombs of the paveway type were brought into use. Airfields were always a target that nobody could miss, though it is not so easy to make a modern permanent airbase unusable. On this occasion, the thuds were assigned to hit the big air base of Phu Kien. The main weapons employed were M117 GP bombs, which each have an actual weight of around 825 pounds. This was in 1967. After 1970, no thud or anything else would have dared loiter in this airspace for fear of getting at least one SAM, surface-to-air missile, up his jet pipe. In turn, the SAM missile and storage areas were later to become targets for U.S. air attacks. Probably half of all sorties flown after 1967 were directed against the Ho Chi Minh Trail. This was not one road, but many and they wound their way through neighboring Laos on their way to South Vietnam. Sophisticated sensors were developed in the Igloo White program to warn of the passage of every truck or even a cyclist. But hitting the various trails was another matter. In the lowland areas, the trail was under repeated attack. In the highlands, choke points, such as the Mu Gai Pass, were major targets, as were easily identified roads. 
All types of missile were fired against these targets in an attempt to close the trail and prevent supplies from reaching the south. Unfortunately, multi-million dollar supersonic fighters were not the ideal weapons for stopping people walking along tracks through the rocky hills and forests. It was easier when the target could be seen, and before long, Many of North Vietnam's bridges were out of commission. They had no neat, prefabricated military engineers' bridges. Everything was done the hard way like the bridge of the River Kwai. And when parts of the Ho Chi Minh Trail were destroyed, instant detours were created through the surrounding forest to bypass the cratered sections. But the one thing that was available to the north was manpower. And with man and woman power, you can very quickly transform a local forest into a new bridge. The work on the trail or the bridges could be punctuated by fresh attacks usually by F-4s flying at about the speed of sound at altitudes too high for the hail of local flak. But that still did not stop even rifles being brought to bear. Rifles would have had even less effect upon these monsters. The Boeing B-52 Stratofortress, backbone of Strategic Air Command, played an increasingly important role in Vietnam, starting with the Arc Light missions in June 1965. Designed to carry a nuclear weapon, they were gutted and rebuilt to carry vast tonnages of ordinary high-explosive bombs. The B-52D was equipped to carry 84 bombs internally and 24 on long external pylons to a total weight of about 89,000 pounds. The rain of bombs from the B-52s was something the VC hated, especially as the bombers flew so high they could be neither seen nor heard. Typical of these attacks were the strikes against NVA positions at Loch Ninh, about 68 miles northwest of Saigon. After arc light came the rolling thunder missions, most of them grueling 12-hour round trips from the slippery runways on the overcrowded island of Guam, about 2,800 miles to the east in the Pacific. Powered by eight big jet engines and with a crew of six, the B-52 added enormously to the tonnage of HE that was poured down on North Vietnam. As early as February 1965, shipments of Soviet SA-2 SAMs began arriving at the port of Haiphong. Though these were among the most primitive and cumbersome SAM systems ever invented, dating from the early 1950s, 
they were gradually deployed in such numbers in North Vietnam that they became a serious menace. In the final linebacker two raids of December 1972, Roughly 1,000 SA-2s were fired, downing at least 15 B-52s. Any crew members who fell into the hands of the North were in for a rough time. Fortunately, by 1972, they were unlikely to be captives for long. The ill-treatment of prisoners, often extending to outright torture, was never far from the minds of Allied air crew. As soon as word came in that a man was down, a rescue team would race to get him back. The usual team was made up of a Sikorsky HH-3C, or 3E helicopter, commonly known as a Jolly Green Giant, especially equipped for the rescue job. was escorted by a Sandy, a Douglas A1E Sky Raider, which combined plenty of weapons with tremendous toughness and the ability to loiter for hours at low level in support of the rescue helicopter. After careful but quick briefing, the team would scramble and head for the spot on the map, which might be in the middle of the jungle. Many flight crew had small radio beacons. If they did not, the only hope was to spot a parachute among the treetops. The winch man would go down, sometimes using a heavy device called a jungle penetrator to burst through the foliage and reach ground level. In seconds, an uninjured rescuee would be on his way back up. was then on for the second crewman about a mile away and with great good luck his parachute is clearly visible. Very quickly, the second man has been hoisted up from certain captivity, ready for debriefing and getting back to operations. Later, Sikorsky developed a monster helicopter the HH-53 Super Jolly, with more than double the power, extensive armor and weapons, and in its final HH-53H form, the ability to rescue pilots at night, in fog or in a blizzard. Throughout the Vietnam War, the beloved C-47 Goonie Bird flew all kinds of missions. However, nobody expected that it would take its place in the battle line and hit the enemy with firepower. The AC-47 version, called Spooky, or Puff the Magic Dragon, was fitted with three 7.62 millimeter miniguns aimed from the left side windows. Each was able to pump out 100 bullets per second. The concept was that as the pilot kept the aircraft slowly orbiting in a banked turn to the left, the three miniguns would pour down a hail of fire upon a target on the ground. Early experience with this pioneer gunship was encouraging. Next came a conversion of a jet-boosted version of the C-123 transport. And finally, a real battleship of the sky. The 18,000 horsepower AC-130 Hercules was like no other combat aircraft before or since. <laughs> <laughs> 
Its guns still fired out to the left as the monster made slow orbits round its target. Circling around meant that the target was hit from all directions. But this aircraft was equipped with radar, sensitive infrared detectors, low light TV, and even a laser. On board, the crew could see from their various screens everything happening on the ground on the blackest night or in the worst weather. Finding a target, they could open up with a battery of guns arranged like those of an old-time galleon. Early versions had four miniguns and four Vulcan 20mm cannon pods, but today's AC-130H has two Vulcan pods, a 40mm Bofors gun and a massive 105mm howitzer. Against an enemy ill-equipped with anti-aircraft weapons, such an onslaught was totally devastating. Tens of thousands of men fought in the skies above Vietnam, and millions of rounds of ammunition were fired for very few tangible results. Almost all the aircraft were on one side, but the war was stern and hard. It is highly unlikely that such a one-sided war in the air on such a scale will ever be fought again.